Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Ah, thank you for coming today. We're so excited to have you. It is my absolute privilege and pleasure to welcome you to the 18th annual Coleman Institute Conference on Cognitive Disability and Technology. Um, my name is Shay Tannis. I'm the acting executive director at the Coleman Institute and thrilled to have you all here today. Um, this conference is really one of a kind in which we bring folks from across the nation, advocates, policymakers, industry partners, designers, students, academics, and researchers. It's a collective of a diverse group who comes together every year to have engaging conversations and dialogue in really advancing technology for people with cognitive disabilities and their family members. So we are so fortunate that we can come together today from the generosity and really the vision of our founding droners, Bill and Claudia Coleman, um, who really began this journey around 20 years ago. Uh, they not only identified what was a dire need, but also an incredible opportunity to be able to see change in people's everyday lives by providing a support of technology. They were really ahead of their time in seeing this 20 years ago. They knew that if they could bring together disparate communities, those with different ideas in a single area to be collective and creative, we could see new possibilities. And that is where the creativity can occur, by having all of you in a room all of you in dialogues to be able to explore what can happen. So like many of us who have been in the field, myself included, the Coleman's were really inspired by a loved one. And that person is Suzanne, <laughs> who's sitting in the front row, or second row. Hello, Suzanne. Um, and so we're honored to have Suzanne here along with Patty and John, her parents and brother and sister-in-law, Greg and Jill. Because these are the people who are going to leverage the new technology. The family members, the community, the advocates, the loved ones, are going to be able to guide us in where we should go with virtual learning, where we should go with connected communities, autonomous vehicles, uh, tactile learning strategies, contextually aware systems, everyone can benefit from these and help to include in the social fabric. And it's this vigorously growing collaboration between users and scientists, engineers, and through these inclusive practices of what will become innovations and promising practices tomorrow. So with that, I am going to tell you a little bit about our program today. Uh, we have a great program in store for you uh, with over 30 sessions, more than 40 speakers, beginning in a moment with a, a, one of our plenary speakers, Director John Martin, who will be introduced by Claudia Coleman. You'll also hear from um, two panels this afternoon where we'll talk about machine learning. We had a really engaging conversation yesterday um, that founding donor Bill Coleman will be able to share with you and moderate, as well as an industry panel. We have some amazing industry partners here today who will be able to talk to you about their inclusive practices and where they see technology and cognitive disabilities engaged in everyday experiences. So that's not all. We certainly have what are our technology futurists, who are researchers and innovators who are bringing together science and disability studies to really push the boundaries of what is possible. And then you will have some very difficult decisions to make. We have 24 breakout sessions. Always the comment we get is, we can't choose. So we have a strategy for you. The strategy is, in your program, there is a picture of all the breakout speakers. If there are folks you want to see, we encourage you to seek them out during lunch, during the breaks, so you can have conversations with them. Because really, we're here to learn and promote new dialogue. 
So we are certainly fortunate in being able to have others support our mission. Uh, and those are going to be our valued partners and sponsors, who I certainly want to thank today. Um, Alliance, who is in Colorado here, the American Association on Intellectual, Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities, the Association of University Centers on Disabilities, Indie Tech, Rest Assured, Therap, NAD, and the WITH Foundation. The WITH Foundation is one that works to promote the establishment of comprehensive healthcare for adults with developmental disabilities that are designed to address their unique and fundamental needs. They have partnered with us this year to bring to you a special track of health technology presentations. So I invite you to see those presentations. They're on the slide right there. Um, and on this stage in 2013, Dr. Braddock, my predecessor, introduced the Declaration on the Rights of People with Cognitive Disabilities to Technology and Information Access. With over 598 organizations endorsing over the country, we continue to pursue this right. We continue to endorse and support others in their um, advancement and access. So what you will see outside this room are what are our Declaration Implementation grantees. For the past three years, we have been fortunate to be able to give small grassroots grants to folks who want to demonstrate what those principles look like in practice. So we have four this year that you'll be able to see just outside this room, and I invite you to go and visit those presentations. You'll also be able to hear from this past year's Declaration Implementation grantees. They'll be giving two presentations about what they have accomplished in just one year. So with that, as many of you know, none of this could happen without the support of what are very dedicated professionals on the Coleman Institute team. And I need to be sure that they are recognized, and I hope you would be able to recognize them as they're walking around today doing their amazing work. So certainly our Coleman Institute team includes Genevieve Berry, who will be in the back. You'll see her in her red shirt. <laughs> Jennifer Kraft, Joy Wu, and Amy Lulinski. Uh, certainly we want to thank the team that has helped with the registration, which is Assistive Technology Act Partners. They are run by Kathy Bodine, and their support has been amazing over the years. So I want to thank them as well as our conference volunteers. So with that, I wish you a day full of fruitful and rewarding discussions as you imagine new possibilities walking through the day. And now, on the stage, I would like to introduce Claudia Coleman. Good morning, everyone. For those of you who are out of state, I hope you have an extra day so you can go to the mountains. This is absolutely the most glorious time to be in Colorado. Uh, it's almost like the whole place has been photoshopped. It really is stunning, so welcome. I have the uh, pleasure of introducing John Martin. Who is John Martin? Inquiring minds want to know, John. John was appointed as director in 2007 by then Governor Strickland in the Ohio Department of Development, Developmental Disabilities, then reappointed by Governor Kasich in 2011. Prior to coming to the department, Martin was the executive director of a large, diverse provider organization. He was a live-in house parent in a group home, a direct care worker with medically involved children, a special education teacher, and the president of a software company. That is an incredible resume. He is also the parent of three children, one of whom has significant disabilities. The presentation John is going to provide today is all about, is all about the Ohio journey, making Ohio a technology first state. I asked John, I says, gosh, you know, what is the definition of that? And he says, well, quite frankly, that's my whole presentation. So rather than me paraphrasing what I think John is going to say, it gives me great pleasure to introduce him to the podium here. Please welcome him. Oh, 
Okay, thank, thank you for that uh, kind introduction. It's, <clears throat> it's an honor to, uh, to be here. Um, I have always had incredible admiration for uh, the Coleman Institute, uh, the work prior to Shea of uh, Dave Braddock and others. S State of the States is something that we use all of the time in Ohio that kind of sets benchmarks for our states. We can compare it to other states, help us uh, set goals, et cetera. So the work of the Coleman Institute has always been extremely important to us. Um, <clears throat> so I wanted to share a little state of the state data. I thought it'd be only appropriate first to give you a little bit of an idea when I talk about our initiative in Ohio, a little bit about Ohio, who we are. So many of you may know this, we're seventh in the nation in population. We have the third largest developmental disability budget in the United States. So we follow uh, Cal uh, California and New York, and we battle for Pennsylvania for third and fourth. Um, we are 11th in per capita spending. The other interesting thing about, so I think I just flipped to the second slide, is that Ohio is a county-based system, and our counties are taxing authorities, and they raise over a billion dollars a year in revenue. And when you look at all of the states in the United States, only 1.6 billion per the state of the states is raised nationally. And again, we raise a billion of it in Ohio and only 16 other states uh, raise funds. That has a lot to do with the structure of our system as well as how a state thinks about changing systems. The other one, the last piece of information up there is not from state of the states. Uh, but Mark Tassai from uh, University of uh, Ohio State University provided the last one up there, which is that uh, our football and basketball teams, I think, dominate Colorado. So it's important to be honest. <laughs> Sorry. I, I don't, we don't track baseball in Ohio. <laughs> that, that's, that's really viewed as a minor sport. So there is really one, that's football. Anyway, the second thing about, so after a little bit about Ohio, a little bit about myself. Uh, so as noted, I'm the parent of three children, and our middle son, Joel, has very significant uh, disabilities. And so my kind of lone experience with technology was when he was about five or six years old, so his pretty much inability to use most of his uh, uh, muscles. So, you know, he, he, he can't chew. His arms and his legs don't work, really extreme uh, spasticity. Uh, uh, but his eyes tell you everything. And, and anyway, so we had this little barking dog. Somebody gave us this battery-operated barking dog, just drive you nuts. It just would bark and it would move. And I thought, he, he loved it. And I thought, hey, that would be neat if I could hook up a switch so that he could make that barking dog go on and off by himself. And so I got this switch, and it's very, you know wired into it, got into it, and so that Joel could kind of take his hand. And today he still, he can't use him, but that time he could, he had the ability to use his hand. He could use push his hand over, and he can make that dog bark. And uh, quite frankly, drove us nuts. So we thought, boy, there should be something else he could run with the switch. And so we had this race car set. You know, the race cars go round and round. And so being a technology, we took, we took one of the two that would race each other, and I took, put a rubber band around the thing that you would uh, pull to kind of set it the right way so that it would run on itself. And then his brother would run the other one. He would pull it. And then I, again, used the switch to break into it so that he could turn that on and off. But the speed had to be set. I was not sophisticated enough to figure that out. So then he could race his brother with that. And then we graduated to electric trains. And I built an electric train set. And again, he could run that electric train uh, with, with his switch and things that he loved to do. And then we got some of those talking buttons, you know, where you could hit. I think they cost like, I don't remember, they're called Big Macs or something. You could hit them and they would, they would talk. And he kind of liked it, but eh, it was nothing like a train, so never got used much. Anyway, so we were excited about some of these things, and, and w 
we thought, boy, it'd be wonder, wonderful if Joel could, Joel could communicate better to us. And, and so we were looking at these new talking machines that were coming out. I think it was a Dynavox, I'm not sure. We looked at it at school. They said, yeah, you got to get it. This, this will be wonderful. And uh, so we spent 10,000 bucks we didn't have uh, on, on this uh, Dynavox thing. And, you know, if you're, if you're going to compete a Dynavox with an electric, Joel had no interest. He had absolutely no interest in that machine. And they tried it at school. We tried it at home. And what we found out that worked were two, three, five, th two, three five, by five cards you would carry in your back pocket, and one would say yes, and one would say no, and you would say, hey, Joel, do you want to, and you would say, this is yes, this is no, and in his early years, he could kind of point to the yes or no, and then now we know that he just looks, and you have to, have to watch his eyes because his, his arms don't work well at all anymore. And, and the point of that lesson is, in that story, is, is kind of to beware of shiny objects. Um, that, that there's a lot of simple stuff that works. And oftentimes, as we look at technology and we look at these things, we really get enthralled by new, shiny things. And so, you know, trying to really keep in mind, what is it that works? What is it that makes people's lives better? And then how do we uh, make sure that those things that truly make folks' lives better, that we're able to incorporate into our systems. But the only thing I wanted in all that rambling to communicate is, I'm not a technology expert. And the reason I think I was asked here, I have no idea, uh, was that what we as state directors have to be good at is strategic thinking. And how do we think about moving our systems forward? Because huge state systems move at the speed of glaciers. They are hard to move, although glaciers are moving very quickly with global warming. So maybe I need a new uh, example. But anyway, historically, they were slow for those of you uh, younger people in the crowd. Anyway, but, and, and so how do we look at moving our systems forward? And our biggest challenge is workforce and fiscal sustainability. Um, the amount of money it takes to drive our systems, and it's a workforce that, that we just can't uh, find adequate numbers of and can't retain the people that we have. And so while technology is no panacea, I believe it is an incredible uh, tool to have in our toolbox as, as we look at dealing with that issue. And so when we came out of the recession, so my worst time in state government, was being hired at a time that the economy just started to dive. And so state revenues were just diving every month. It's the most painful thing I ever went through. And the governor and his staff, they, they'd go back to each state agency and say, what can you cut? What can you reduce? What can you, what can you do? Just horrible, horrible times. We had to cut about, I think about $60 million uh, out of our budget, and, and again, really tough times. And so what we really started to talk about coming out of that recession was uh, sustainable service models, things that maybe were more cost effective and, and for the long term. And so we looked at shared living. Colorado does a lot in shared living. You're one, of, as you probably know, one of the leaders in that area. Um, we in Ohio weren't, so we have heavily invested in increasing that. Employment first, I'll talk a little bit about getting more people employed. And then technology supports, which is kind of the purpose of that. So uh, we, we started slowly. In 2013, we were one of the early states to get uh, remote monitoring and technology reimbursed in our Medicaid waiver. And what we talked about is we went around the state and tried to promote some of these models is really saying, you know, we, we don't know much about this technology thing. We're not sure how the remote monitoring stuff exactly works. Uh, but we think it's important, and we want to move forward slowly and planfully so that we can learn from, from those experiences. And at the same time, we started to aggressively uh, use telepsychiatry. And one of the, we, we couldn't get psychiatric services to remote areas of the state. And so working with Wright State Universities, one of our great university partners, um, we started doing it. And today we serve over 1,300 people a year with telepsychiatry. And there's an interesting lesson that we learned from telepsychiatry that's now plays into our remote monitoring and the expansion of that technology. 
And that while our lead psychiatrist was very reluctant to get into telepsychiatry because she thought that face-to-face -face between the psychiatrist and the individual was absolutely critical. But what she and her other partners have learned is that oftentimes through the technology, the two-way technology, that people are more open and more direct and make more eye contact than if it was face-to-face. So it doesn't just become a technology that we're using because we can't find psychiatrists in remote areas. It's, it's switched to being a technology we're using because for a lot of people it's more effective. And she, and she tells a beautiful story of a person that she had counseled for two years. And a, 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 a young lady with very promiscuous sexual behavior into a lot of issues and she could never get her to open up. The first time she does remote technology after two years, the lady tells her her uncle is sexually abusing her. And again, it was safe to do it through that communication that was not safe to do face to face. So we started with that, uh, uh, doing that. Uh, we also are now doing tele-EI with another one of our university par uh, partners, uh, Akron Children's Hospital, and, and finding some really res nice results with that as well. So supportive technology, to get into it in Ohio, these are the definitions uh, that, that we use. It's technology that can support a person in accomplishing a task or provide care from a distance is known as supportive technology. And we, we classify it in two different areas and our, our new rules that we are fi filing actually reimburse it in two different areas in our Medicaid waivers. Um, assisted technology and remote supports. And so while often assisted technology is you know, uh, uh, paired with remote monitoring, also a lot of times it's used without remote monitoring as well, obviously. And you know, examples, which I'm sure a lot of your presenters will talk about, uh, automatically turning off uh, stoves, step-by-step uh, -step assistance with all kinds of things. So uh, lots of ways. So we, uh, we, we reimburse assistant technology. And we have a lot of assistive technology lending libraries around the state that absolutely nobody knows about and nobody visits. Uh, and so we just, uh, our DD Council did a grant, uh, found all 60 of them, or 65, and we're now trying to promote that and make people aware of it, as well as to get those lending libraries to upgrade some of the things that they lend to people to start using and lending a lot of the off-the-shelf stuff. That, uh, that, that can really make a difference to people. So then remote supports is uh, what I want to talk uh, pretty much the rest of my talk about today, um, is offering a person with developmental disabilities the support of the provider even when the provider's not in their home. So their provider is using something like Skype, FaceTime, uh, some other kind of communication uh, device. And so in our first four years that this was available, um, we moved out to, we have had about 100 people using this technology. And kind of the interesting thing was that a bunch of the use was not driven by us, which is always the case. Who drives our system? Families drive our system. And we had a number of really neat families who kind of came together and uh, put together uh, technology for their sons and daughters. And the neat thing was they provided a lot of early stories uh, for us. So anyway, you know, I was, I was learning these stories, and I don't know how many of you have ever had a chance to, to get to know Governor Kasich, but he is not a shy uh, man. And in one of our cabinet meetings, he was lecturing us about our failure to not use robots or technology in our state agencies and ask, Martin, are you using robots to help people with disabilities? You're always complaining you're not finding staff. And uh, so I said, this is not taped, is it? No, oh, anyway, sorry. Ah, he won't watch. Anyway, so, anyway, so, I, I, uh, so, I, so I jumped in. And, and the neat thing was I had a bunch of, of, of stories. And one was there was a group of parents who had uh, uh, sons who were in their uh, late teens, early 20s with, with autism. And these parents had put a bunch of technology in their son's house. And one of them was, one of, the, one of the young men with autism, that the family knew from him living at home with them that 
if his day started with a shower, the rest of the day went fine. If he didn't get that shower in the morning, there was hell to pay. Things just didn't, things just didn't go well. And so the dad put a sensor on the shower that would tell him if his son was taking a shower at 5.30 in the morning. And if he was, fine. Went on to his phone. If, if he wasn't, he knew he had to call a house, get his son in the shower, and get that going for the day to be okay. So uh, that, that was one of the stories I shared with, with the governor. Kind of another interesting one uh, was we had a, a, uh, an individual that had really pretty extreme uh, behaviors. And under our waiver program, we were spending about $145,000 a year in staff to support that individual. And they eloped, they fought with staff, constant uh, tension, they couldn't keep staff in the house, and they would always respond by adding more staff, which, as some of you know, just, just creates more problems. But anyway, so one of the people got the idea, why don't we look at remote support? So they brought one of the companies in to look at it, and the company said, no, no, we, we don't use remote supports in that way. Uh, we use it for folks with have just, you know, don't have a lot of significant issues. It would never work. Long story short, they did put it in. As soon as they put it in, the person stopped running away, didn't have any staff to, uh, to argue with anymore. They could communicate. It's kind of the story of the psychiatrist, that once they were communicating through people, through the, the, the television, through that monitoring system, they weren't fighting with them anymore, and they liked them, and they formed relationships. Our costs dropped from 145000 a year to 45000 a year, and the individual has now started to reduce the remote supports and will probably be living totally independently without any supports. And so, again, those are some of the stories that we uh, uh, told. I better get uh, going. But, but part of the positive experience was then in sharing these uh, with the governor then. He invited me. Uh, he had a big technology push, and, and myself and three other cabinet members went around the state talking about technology. And, you know, the others was these uh, driverless cars, the transportation was working on some stuff, and uh, cybersecurity and, and, and things like that. So I was kind of the, the human service representative that talked about uh, what we were uh, doing. And one of the neat things then, he stole my stories and told them at the state of the state. Um, so out of this then, he awarded us a very substantial grant to look at how we as a department could expand technology. And so we worked with Nysonger Center, uh, one of our great partners that we have in Ohio with the universities uh, who, who do a wonderful job in supporting our work. And so what we wanted to do before we aggressively expanded this was to look at what we were doing with those 100, 120 individuals, look at what was working and what wasn't. And, and to talk to families, talk to individuals, talk to providers, find out what's working and what isn't. Look at what we could expand, what part of the technology could we dramatically expand in the state. And then lastly, is there something that we should have that doesn't exist that would help us expand the use of, of technology? And simultaneous to that then, we hired, we call him an evangelist, his name is Kyle. If he doesn't double the use, he gets fired. Um, uh, I'll add something to that later, but anyway, you know, if you're an evangelist and you're not bringing people into church, what, which you, you have no use, right? So, and anyway, we told Kyle. Anyway, what he does, he goes, he worked with Nice Songer Center, and he goes around the state promoting the use of technology and helping uh, to get providers, families, um, individuals with disabilities, uh, our county board service and support, working together. Uh, to help increase the use and r raise awareness. And again, works very closely uh, with the Nysonger Center on the grant and what came out of it. So Nysonger, they'll be presenting after me, uh, and they did a really neat white paper. Uh, and here were some of the findings that came out. 90% um, of the recipients would recommend it to others. You know, we heard a lot about safety, yet over half of the individuals felt the remote monitoring safety was the most important aspect of it and uh, really turned from a concern to a strength. 
Uh, 25 out of 35 uh, said it gave them great independent, greater independence, and that's what we're hearing a lot as well. And that while privacy was a concern, uh, 45 out of 51 said they felt some privacy. And again, I'd encourage you to, uh, to attend the session after this on the white paper in terms of things that they're finding from families. Um, and then kind of the la well, last significant finding was that one of the things adults with DD like most is the staff who are they're uh, connecting with remotely. So one of the neat things, this is not something replacing staff, it's something that's delivering staff to the individual through a different platform. Again, kind of like the, uh, the telepsychiatry I mentioned. So nice song put together, I thought by now, you know, you need a break from hearing me ramble. And Nysonger did a very nice video that we are using uh, that, that kind of shows some of these themes of outcome. It's kind of showing how uh, the technology is being used. And we use it as part of our kind of toolbox to promote the use around the state. So it's an example of something that we're using to try to promote it. The first family there, they're really neat people. They serve on our tech council, uh, Howard and, and his wife. And they did a neat thing. They opened up their home. And so they brought all of the service and support administrators in their county into their home to see how it was working, how it works for their son, and provided free beer. Uh, but all the service coordinators were on the clock. And from what we were told, nobody, at least uh, publicly, took any of the beer, according to the dad. He was stuck with it all. I think it was cheap Budweiser or something. Um, Anyway, so, so now that we had kind of a full-time staff doing the work uh, with us, we had this white paper from the Nysonger Center, which again, they'll be talking about after this presentation if you're interested. We had the support of the Tech Council, with, which uh, Shea participated in some. Nysonger had put together a Tech Council to help us do this evaluation and look at how we might want to move forward. Also, I think Dan Davies from out in your neck of the woods uh, helped on that as, as well. And then we had the successful example of employment first. So a lot of our states have done employment first uh, as, as a model. So uh, we approached the governor about using an executive order to declare Ohio a technology first state. And it simply meaning, means, and all of you in this crowd are probably familiar with it, but for Everybody that we serve in our system, every year we do an annual uh, plan, a person-centered plan, where we look at what's important to the person, uh, what can we do to support them, what are their needs, etc. And all we're saying with Technology First, like we did with Employment First, we want you to talk about technology in those meetings. And that really, that should be discussed first because it is a less intrusive service than direct support staff. So that should be the thing you should be talking about first. Is there a way technology can help somebody's life? And so that's what we, uh, what, what we mean by it. Um, <clears throat> and one of the things we learned in employment first when we rolled that baby out was we got strong pushback because people were thinking we were saying employment only. Oh, you're saying now, you know, I don't have a choice. And so we had to say, no, no, it's not employment only, it's employment first. We want you to talk with the individual first about it. Uh, we want you to explore options with them, et cetera. But we're not saying everybody has to work. So our field was used to that model, and that's why we wanted, again, to tie on and, and, and use that. So we, we kind of learned that lesson. And we've had incredible success from employment first. So we've gone from about 21% of the folks we serve uh, in employment to we're up to 30% today, which I think we're one of the leading large states in the nation in terms of number of people employed. So again, our field was used to it, but we also knew how much hard work it took to get there. And, and we see the same thing with technology. So I think that next then, I want to show you the, uh, the press conference. Ohio now today is one of the leaders nationally in technology. This is an executive order for technology first. We want folks to think about technology first and ways that technology can make that person's life better. We are here today because of the support of a lot of folks in our community. We've developed these um, 
uh, custom sensors and call buttons that um, have, they can monitor the environment, they can... So again, as you're thinking in, in your state about, um, you know, moving forward, getting the support for us of the governor has been absolutely huge. He's been a champion. Uh, he's helped us with uh, funding, and he has opened the door to some technology companies because of his uh, in involvement with this. So ag again, it's, it's, I think, something attractive, and as you I, and in your state are looking at how to expand technology, again, I encourage you to see if, if it's something that you, you can't get your governor involved with. So the executive order, executive orders have to be signed by a governor, so you need them involved to do that. And in our executive order then, we had, there were two outcomes to the order, and one I talked a little bit about, which was to make Ohio a technology first state. Again, that we want to make sure that we're having conversations with everybody in our system to look at, is there a way technology could make their life better? The second thing that the executive order did is it created a tech council. Um, we called it a technology first council that as a foundation, again, we looked to the Coleman Institute, University of Colorado, and we went over with the council, the committee, the rights of people with cognitive disabilities to technology and information access and kind of use that as one of the foundations of our tech council as, as we looked at moving forward and helping people understand that just as, you know, the ADA really helped us as a field think about, you know, opening up buildings to folks with, uh, with disabilities, you know, all the curb cuts, parking spots, integrate, I mean, it really helped us think about how do we integrate folks uh, into their, uh, their, their community. And how do we address the barriers? How do we address the things that get in the way of them uh, getting into their communities? And just kind of a list of those on, on the side of barriers that need to be addressed. So what we said to the council, your task is to look at what are the barriers to technology to the folks that we serve in our system. And what are the curb cuts, the ramps, the doors that need widening? You know, what, what do we need to do to get that access? Um, and kind of the challenge being, so in the middle, the bridge is that person-centered planning meeting. And as well, in Ohio, we have a waiting list uh, assessment initiative going on where we have a ton of people on our waiting list, and we're changing the way we do our waiting list. And so part of what we want to make sure that as our service coordinators are working their way through the waiting list, that oftentimes, knowing a bit about technology, that it could be a $200 piece of technology would make that person's life better while they're on that waiting list, waiting for a more comprehensive form of services. So again, wanting to uh, make sure we're thinking about it as we work through the waiting list, but probably as important or more important are those person-centered planning meetings that I talked before. And the, the challenge being, so we have the individual support needs over here, and then we have technology and knowledge on this side, and bridging that gap is a huge amount of work because most of our service coordinators, you know, struggle with their cell phones, quite frankly, people like me, you know, we, we're not technology people. That's not what is natural for us uh, to think about first. And so, again, that's really what we're saying to our council. That is your challenge. And when we looked at the makeup of the council, so as soon as it was announced in the governor's executive order, we got all kinds of requests from all these technology companies to participate on the council. And we said, no, we have no technology expert at all on the council. Because we didn't think that was what was going to help us move our system forward. And so what we wanted was kind of key folks in our system that were in leadership positions that would actually have the ability 
to look at how to move it forward. And then as we looked at uh, working through the work of the council, we had six months. So our deliverable has to be <clears throat> done in six months. And that's because at the time we did this, I was leaving in six months, still am leaving in six months. And what we wanted the council to do is to put together a roadmap that we would then deliver to our current governor, who's term limited out in uh, early January, and that we would then have a roadmap to present to the next administration uh, to continue to move this initiative uh, forward. So that's kind of what, what we were looking at. And so then in, in our first, so we have just six meetings to complete this work. And in this, after the first meeting, kind of laying out the charge, presenting data, showing where we're at, which I'll go over some of that in a few minutes, um, uh, that we then in the second meeting had all of our technology uh, vendors who are approved. So we have six vendors approved uh, for remote supports come in and spend each about 30 minutes talking to the council about what they do, how their system works, et cetera, so that we would bring them up to speed, the tech council, on what's out there and what can people use. The second meeting then, we brought in families. And that was a lot of fun. Mark was there. It was just a great meeting. We had families and individuals who were using the remote support, some who were pictured here and some others who talked about how they're using it, what the difference is in their life, how important it is to them. And many of them were kind of using it in different ways. And so our hope was that by looking at what is, looking at the experience of people, we can now start addressing what some of those barriers are. And uh, none of our council members with uh, pointing out problems or issues in our system. So it's really helping us kind of uh, move this forward. As I mentioned, you know, we have a six month task. We're halfway uh, there. Um, and again, lots of very uh, robust discussions uh, about what's working and what isn't and things that we can move forward. So a number of parallel efforts then, so things that we are doing um, to help support this initiative that we're putting in place. Uh, one is uh, keeping the data in front of us. And so we use, I think it's Tableau or some tool like that that, that uh, synthesizes all of our data for us. And we have 88 counties. As I mentioned, you know, we are a county-based system. Um, the state does not have a contract for service coordination. Each individual county does that with their individual administrative uh, structure. And so we analyze data on a county by county basis, how many counties are using remote technology, how much are they using, et cetera. And then we also are doing it on a provider by provider basis to, uh, to, to, to help make sure we know what's going on. Now you can probably absolutely not see or read this, but just a quick explanation. This is one of our heat maps that, that we use. And so if you had wonderful eyesight, and this was actually clear, you would be able to see how many people in each county are using uh, uh, remote uh, monitoring technology, remote support technology. And the colors then tell you the company. So as I mentioned, we have six companies currently. And uh, each uh, circle is made up of either one uh, color, which says it's all one uh, company, or the, the circle is multiple colors, which uh, tells you which it is. So we use this. One of the things in, uh, that we are working toward is we want every county, as part of their strategic plan, to think about technology and to think about its use and to think about how it can move forward. And one of the things that we learned from Employment First, as well as trying to increase the use of shared living, that we wanted to make sure that we have every, every county having someone who's using the service. Because that's how we really learn and learn from each other. And so that if we have somebody in every county, it then, again, will, will, uh, will, will help us move it forward. So this is the kind of data that we look at. It's also the data that will tell us whether our evangelist gets fired or keeps his job. And so noting here, a number of counties uh, have, um, 
have, have already put in their, they are required by the state to do uh, strategic plans. So we require counties to do strategic plans. And what we're now kind of adding, and most of them are doing voluntarily, is looking in their county, how are they going to increase uh, the use? And so I said one county in the final is developing a virtual house. So we actually have, I think, uh, three houses about to come online. And they are houses that have a number of different kinds of remote uh, support technology in them. And so an individual can come in, uh, spend the night, see how it works, see if it's something they like. One of them has a place set up for the pan their parents, if their parents want to come in, see how it works, watch it, etc. So that we're trying to, again, establish uh, a number of these uh, around the state to increase people's knowledge, see how it works, and reduce some of the fear about it. <clears throat> we have uh, uh, the department also, we are looking at um, setting one up on one of our state-operated uh, centers so that we would have a space as well that people could come in, see, use, and, and see if that's something that they think would be helpful to them. One of the interesting things is that as we're doing this, the, the technology vendors have become so busy that we're struggling getting them into these virtual homes uh, to set up examples uh, because they're having trouble right now uh, keeping up with the demand uh, to, uh, to, to provide the service. Um, we had some money, uh, as, as we know, like always, we overpay Nysonger. They always have more money than they need for everything that we work with them on. And uh, so we looked at, at the fact that we had some additional funds left. And so working with them, they put out gr grants to say, hey, could we get some, I call them our... Uh, uh, evangelism cartel. Uh, could, could we set up around the state some advocates, uh, some people who really understand it that could support their area of the state, particularly in areas where we have drought? So if you could have seen that chart, you would see that there's parts of the state where we have virtually nobody using technology. And so we want to embed somebody in that region who has knowledge, who can help train the SSAs, who can help them work on their strategic plans, etc. And the neat thing was, I think, Mark, you had money for nine or ten, uh, something like that. And then our DD Council, which is very involved in this project and sits on our tech council, they then provided a grant. Uh, we had uh, about 16, 17 folks apply, and uh, so we now have enough money that everybody that, with the DD Council money and the Nysonger grant, that uh, we can have 15 folks, and they will then be touching uh, 50 of our 88 counties. Uh, so again, we, we think this is going to be long-term one of the strategies of building that infrastructure to keep the technology uh, uh, moving forward. The other kind of neat thing, um, on our tech council is the VR agency. Uh, they go under different names in different states, our Voc Rehab Agency. And as we put out this grant, and they were participating in our discussions around that, they have put out uh, a, a grant for, I think, a quarter million dollars, 250000 to look at how to use technology to support people in employment. And so we're really hoping to get some creative ideas out of that. Um, it's not something that we are doing uh, much of at all, but a number of folks have some, some cool ideas, so we hope that having those grants out there are going to stimulate some creative thinking and look at, again, different ways of, of supporting folks in the, in the employment area. Um, we have looked at our reimbursement rule. Part of the council's uh, work is to say, is there anything about the state's policies that are slowing down or getting in the way or barriers? So one of the things we know, we have to redo our rules. So we have a new draft rule out to do it. And one of the neat things is that it looks like we, we always struggled that CMS would not uh, uh, pay for the internet connectivity. You know, They always had that fear that if we put internet service in the house to run this, these systems, that on a Sunday afternoon, the person with disabilities might watch a Cleveland Browns football game. 
and Medicaid would be using its money to support something like that. And uh, certainly not a medical necessity to watch that game. And so we couldn't get it approved early on when we tried. They would not approve it. The neat thing is they now are. And so as we bring our, rule, uh, our rules up to kind of the modern times, uh, that is something that will now be reimbursable and we think will help moving our system forward. We're making some other changes in that as well. <clears throat> We've done a lot of work to try to inform families because, again, it's families who really drive systems. And so we, we have a, a really strong communication department, which I'll refer to a little bit, but they do family chats, Facebook Live. Um, they've done two on remote supports directed at families, having other families come in and do it. And it's, it's, again, it's a way that you can get communication out uh, to the states, to the state, and often, uh, after we, you know, we do the initial one live and put it online, and we'll have two or 3,000 families watch those things over the next couple of weeks. So it's, it's a good way for us to look at getting those examples out there, uh, showing the stories of other families to help them think about how that might be good for their, uh, their family members. The same thing for our support coordinators. We do live uh, chats uh, focused um, on that. And we have handouts, again, again, something you'll never read from your seat, um, but we put these hand, handouts together, how to start using remote supports, again, to use both with families as well as uh, to use um, with our support coordinators to kind of get them, them talking about it. And again, it's their provider of homemaker personal care services who will kind of work with the family and then it is they who will contract with the technology vendor. So it's, it's not necessarily the family that's doing that. The family's choosing the, res, the, the provider who's going to be doing the backup, if they're using backup, and then that person selects the, the vendor. Um, if the family is doing it like uh, Howard uh, and his wife who were on the video, who did the free beer uh, to get all the SSAs to come who didn't drink it, um, that in that case, they're the volunteer. They, they are the staff who provide the support. They're the ones who communicate unless they're on vacation. And so in that case, they would select uh, the remote vendor because uh, they, they are the, the backup folks. One of the things that we are also emphasizing um, to our service coordinators that it really it's not up to you to necessarily know technology that's not going to necessarily you know help I mean it's, it's helpful but you need to know your person you really need to know them and if you know them and you know what's important to them and and you have a good understanding of their needs and their strengths that that if you know that, it then becomes easy for the technology vendors to communicate and, and, and kind of fill in the holes and say, boy, you know, if you're looking for something that would do this, we could do this, we could do that, we could. So again, it's, it's that, that emphasis to really know your people and then when it's appropriate, bring the technology vendors in so that they're not just driving these discussions out of nowhere but rather they're coming in when the need has already been identified and people are thinking about, oh, hey, I wonder if we could do this or I wonder if we could, uh, we, we could do that. I mentioned our communication team. We have a technology first website, which you're uh, more than willing uh, to, to go on. Uh, you can hear a lot of stories. Uh, we also have, when our council meets, we videotape presentations, so anybody can go online and see the presentations that have been done to the council, so that that's, you know, we want to make sure we're, we're being transparent and that everybody in the state has access and can see the work that is, is being done. Uh, we have a home, it's a picture of it here, and you can kind of click through and see 16 different examples of uh, assisted uh, tech uh, stuff and as again we, we also do our tech council and presentations there every Tuesday we put out a tech Tuesday message so one of the things is we've changed our communication style every Monday is memo Monday and we send it out to I don't know six seven thousand people and then it's often shared with others so we started doing then uh, the last year called tech Tuesday 
and we send messages out, keeping the field informed about what's available. Again, sometimes it may just be one of these family stories that we've taped and they have an opportunity uh, to watch. And we continue to try to collect more stories because it's, it's really the stories of people that expands and drives this. And then we have an online training program now where our direct support staff can go online and get 60 hours of training. Once they get it, we then pay a dollar an hour more uh, for their services if they have initiated that training. So we're putting together a package, uh, one of the training modules that will help direct support staff kind of understand what we're doing. To some of them, this is threatening, you know, because they view, uh, some of them view that, oh boy, they're gonna come in and do this and I'm gonna lose my job. And, you know, that's not the case. We, we can't find enough people and again, you may be still doing supports, but it may be through uh, the use of technology. So we, we want to do a better job of training our staff and our service coordinators, so we're looking at uh, putting that together. So kind of concluding, um, uh, as of today, uh, we have 340 users uh, in 62 of 88 counties. So again, our focus is on some of the counties with none. We are now adding almost one person a day uh, to remote technology after we've started to do uh, this, this, uh, this gear up. The other interesting thing is on the average, we save about $10,000 per use of remote technology over if we were using staff. So you can see the potential for, uh, for, for savings of, of real money. Now, the, the interesting thing is that when we started doing this, that was kind of my main, our, our, part of our main objective was, hey, we'd save money, we can't find staff, we need to be doing this. What has happened is, as we've listened to the stories, it's really flipped in that, yes, yeah, saving the money's nice, but the people using it like it. And it's creating greater independence, and it's making their lives better. And so it's not just about saving staff, and I think, you know, as you as a state, or if you're looking at how you expand this or how you move it forward, um, that uh, th the reason for doing it is, is absolutely uh, important because, you know, everybody thinks, and families are, are, are very skeptical people, that we bureaucrats only care about saving money. And so actually we got some criticism early on that, oh, you're just trying to save money. Well, yeah, we are, uh, but what's cool is, yeah, we're saving money, but people's lives are, are, are getting better. One of the things we're looking at, um, by the way, Mark, I, I don't know if we mentioned this. Um, Mark, some of you know, Mark Tasse is the director of Nice Songer Center that works a lot with us. They do NCI for us. And by next year, we will have enough people using that we could do an NCI sample just of people using technology. And, we th and it, there would be enough people that it would be representative. And so I, I think it'd be really cool to get a sense of the responses on the NCI of people using technology versus those not, and kind of seeing there's a lot of questions about do you feel safe in your home? Do you, I, I, and I, I just think it would be really a uh, neat uh, comparison to kind of see. And just my last uh, observation there is I have two minutes left, um, is that you know, it's, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work, and, and it does not occur naturally. And so the, the, the one thing that I wanted to kind of communicate is that if your state is not already thinking about the kind of support systems you need in place or the structure or the strategy of, of moving forward in this very important area, because the staffing issue is not going away, we, we can't afford to keep up with wages. And if we don't make things like this a priority, we are doing a huge disservice to the people that we serve. And so the, the goal was to kind of share the journey that we've been on in Ohio and what we are looking at and just the importance that this will not happen overnight and it will only happen if, uh, if the structures and the training is put in place to uh, move this initiative forward and most importantly, uh, make the lives better of the folks that uh, uh, their families have um, 
put confidence and trust in us as state agencies to provide services to. So thanks, it's been an honor to be here and I appreciate the opportunity to share what we're doing.